All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome in. It's just dubs. Good Saturday morning to you. It's John Dickinson. It's Greg Silver. It's KNBR, the sports leader on YouTube, Twitch, and the Twitter er, 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 X stream here on a Saturday with one day to go in the NBA regular season. It has been a wild ride for the Warriors over the course of these last couple of weeks. But last night, Greg Silver, unfortunately, the Warriors just get throttled in a big second quarter by the Pelicans and all of the dreams of uh, potentially getting to uh, the, the eight spot are, are all but gone at this point. Not mathematically. The Warriors could still technically get to eight. They could be eight, nine or ten. It's the uh, trinity of the Warriors, Kings and Lakers over the last couple of years, these teams always seemingly connected to each other. We're going to lay out all the scenarios for tomorrow, 1230 Pacific. Everybody's going to play, but uh, Greg just want to first off, welcome you in and we'll get this thing going. Maybe talking about uh, the game last night and just some of the disappointment at uh, what turned out to be a missed opportunity because the Warriors ended up, uh, they ended up losing and the Kings ended up losing, which was kind of the, uh, one of many crazy uh, circumstances and, and events that went down last night. Yeah. Talk about a way to start the show for us last night. We're finishing up with the Warriors. I had giants on my end and then we're watching the Kings as we're in segment number one and that whole thing crumbled too. So uh, first of all, good morning. I mean, not a lot has changed since you all last heard from me. I put together the show. I got in the car, went home and slept and now I'm here. So uh not a lot's changed, but definitely had more time to process it a little bit and a little bit of a fresher brain with some coffee, too. So life is good. Um, you know, quick little warm up question as people kind of filter in here. Do you know what warrior, what former Golden State Warrior is celebrating their birthday today? Oh, my goodness. Former Golden State Warrior. Like like what era? We believe era. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I couldn't tell you. I, I could not tell you. It is our guy, Baron Davis. Happy okay. birthday to you, Baron. One of what? the greatest dunks, if not the greatest dunk in franchise history. Oh, yeah. No no doubt. Uh, on on what? Kirilenko, right? In the, yeah. in the second round series against the Jazz after the Warriors had, had upset Dallas. Uh, well, yeah. Happy birthday to Baron Davis. No, no question. Um, yeah, let's I, I, let's just kind of dive into last night. Uh, and again, as things sit, uh, the, the Kings were up 16 at home against Phoenix. They ended up losing by a point. Uh, we, we've got the Suns and the Pelicans are still battling for six and seven. The Warriors, Kings and Lakers could all be eight, nine and ten. As it currently sits, though, going into the final day, uh, you look up at the, the NBA standings and the Warriors find themselves back uh, where They've unfortunately been a lot, and that is the 10 spot in, in the uh, play in tournament race. As uh, you look at the Lakers, who last night with their win against Memphis, they passed the Kings and the Warriors, who both ended up losing. So right now, the Lakers are eighth. They're playing the Pelicans tomorrow in New Orleans. And because the Suns came back and won that game in Sacramento, that means that the Pelicans need that game to be sixth in the Western Conference and avoid the play-in tournament. The earlier in the evening development was Denver blowing a 17-point lead in the final 10 minutes at San Antonio to dip now to where they could be and are currently the three seed in, in the Western Conference. So, you know, the, the six is a little less desirable than than maybe it was 24 hours ago. But all of these things, as we've talked about a lot, Greg, are, are interconnected as far as, uh, you know, who's playing who and who's fighting for what. And does this team want this or that? Uh, and the reason that it is in this position now, in part, is because the Warriors didn't play their best game last night against the Pelicans. No, they didn't. And just to kind of reiterate some of what we recapped last night, I thought that the issue of the Warriors not coming out with their best effort at home was for sure not the problem. I thought they were very locked in and intentional in the first quarter. Great defense. Did help that the Pelicans only shot one for eight from three, and then they went on to go 19 of 30, as you mentioned, from that point mm. on. And uh, Trey Murphy, C.J. McCollum just got comfortable. 
And yeah, that tough second quarter really was rough to kind of overcome for Golden State. But, uh, you know, the Pelicans are a good team. You know, they did this without Brandon Ingram and they they are a very good team. Uh, they're a top six team for a reason. And I think the Warriors just had a great effort toward the end. But when you got the games that you got from Steph for three quarters and the seven turnovers in the game, Clay didn't have his best game. Wiggins didn't have his best game. You didn't have Kaminga's athleticism on hand to contend with some of the athleticism. You know, it's a lot to overcome against good teams. You can't win a game in the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, but you certainly can lose it. And I think the Warriors, unfortunately for them, by and large, kind of lost the game with that second quarter. Yeah, 45-22 will do it. And the Warriors end up, you know, trying to rally, basically spending the, the rest of the night trying to rally and, and come back and, and have a shot. And even Steph late down 11, really trying to, to lead the Warriors back. Uh, he ends up with the ball in his hands, down three in the closing seconds. I know there was a heavy debate on, on social media. You got to, you know, call a timeout. Steph took a bad shot. I know my stance has been, Steph's made a, a a Hall of Fame career out of taking and making quote bad shots. Uh, I, I think he didn't love the look that he got, and and he showed it in, in the immediate aftermath. But you know, given the the circumstances of the way that game played out, and and Steph trying to lead him back down the stretch there, I, I'm with you. It was lost in the second quarter, not in the final ten seconds, because Steve Kerr didn't call a timeout or because. Stephen Curry wasn't a little bit more patient in looking for a, a better look as, as the Warriors had had really. I mean, it was it was kind of a miracle opportunity that they were even in that position at that point. But uh, yeah, three point defense turnovers, the worst of the worst for the Warriors this season when they have lost. And, and unfortunately, too often, as we've talked about all year long since we've been doing the show, too often it's been at home where the worst of the worst tends to come out. Yeah. No, I mean, it has what they're 20 and 20 now chance to get above 500 on the season with a win in Utah when they probably rest some players. And uh, one thing that was really interesting to me last night, which we didn't get to address on the show because this came to my attention after the show, but I know I texted you about it. Both Steph and clay individually at the podium were asked about, the missed opportunity to get the eight seed because of that Kings loss. Steph's answer was, I could care less about that. Like I want the best vibes possible going into the playoffs would have been nice to have. We didn't get it. Clay was a little bit more upfront about it and just said it stings a lot. Uh, Two. It's, it's not often that the hall of famers on this team are on different pages, at least publicly. And so I found that interesting but what's your take on all of that, JD? Like, do you think for the Warriors, it's just maybe this is a blessing in disguise, knowing that Curry is clearly fatigued and he's going to get the day of rest now before they got to win multiple elimination games? Or is it, yeah, no, that stinks. If you could have gotten seven, uh, that was everything. Yeah, I, I think, and again, there is still a mathematical uh, opportunity for them to get to the eight. Now, for them to get to the eight, and we'll kind of filter these in, they have to win tomorrow against Utah. And Alpha Nickelberry chimes in here right at the top uh, with, I think, the, the question of the day. And Steve Kerr kind of answered this, I thought, in, in the postgame press conference last night. Uh, JD Alpha says, should the Warriors try to win tomorrow or just accept the 10 seed? I think they can win in Sacramento, but Phoenix and L.A. may be a problem. I, I think they have accepted their fate. Uh, I, I think I think they don't care home versus road. I know we joked about the fact that, that Joe Lacob would probably rather have that 9-10 game be at Chase Center. It may work out that way, uh, but I, I feel like the Warriors tomorrow are going to prioritize rest, and they're going to let the chips fall where they may. If it, if it ends up that they uh, win and some other things happen to where they host it, uh, then so be it. If it winds up being they win and Sacramento somehow loses at home to Portland and the Lakers lose to the Pelicans in a game that the Pelicans need and, and Ingram's likely coming back in that one reportedly would be coming back in that one. 
again, because it's all connected, if if Phoenix doesn't win last night, the Pelicans clinch six, and then the Lakers are probably going to win that game in New Orleans with ease. The The issue is the, the Kings were part of that as well. So now they, you know, the Kings taking the loss changes the calculus on that, but that the Kings taking the loss means the Pelicans have to play harder on Sunday if they want the six. So uh, if it had gone another way, then the game Sunday potentially would go another way in, in, in terms of the setup. Uh, but to answer that question directly and then sort of lead back into the scenarios, Greg, I think the Warriors accepted their fate. Tim Kawakami asked Steve last night, you know, are you going to rest players? And, and Steve had the hell yeah, uh, it, it, you know, I, I, I might or or probably will. And so I, I do think the Warriors are just going to they're going to take the rest, especially now with the possibility and of the uh, nine ten game being on Tuesday. Uh, there, there's a issue with, and it, the last couple of years and, and the intention this year was to have, you know, the nine, 10 games are basically on Wednesday, the eight, seven games are on Tuesday. And then the final elimination game is, is on Friday, but there's a arena conflict in Philadelphia with the flyers who have a game on Tuesday. So if Philadelphia is the seven and Philadelphia could end up, uh, not being seven, but if Philadelphia is the seven and has to play a play in tournament game, they can't play Tuesday because the building's in use by the flyers. So they would have to play Wednesday, which would mean that the nine 10 game is Tuesday and both Western conference play in tournament games would, would be Tuesday and both Eastern conference games would be, would be Wednesday. Uh, so yeah, it, it's interesting when you look at, at that uh, and so it, it sets up this scenario where I think the rest is even more important because you might play Tuesday. And if you have to play Tuesday, regardless, you know, you're not, we sort of talked about it these last couple of weeks as well. If you're in the nine ten game, you're going to get two days between Sunday and, and Wednesday and really maybe three because you're going to play su- with Sunday afternoon. I, I think there's a benefit to the rest and I've been Mr. Go for it. Uh, these last few weeks, like I, I think the Warriors tried to have their cake and eat it too in Portland. It almost bit them. They did it against Utah on Sunday with resting Steph. They were able to win that game. I've been go all in. I think the time has come now where it it doesn't matter. You're going to play Sacramento or you're going to play the Lakers, depending upon where you're at, and, unless you end up somehow eighth. But if you end up somehow eighth, then – all right, great. Like it doesn't matter if you're going to play the Pelicans or the, or, or, or the Suns at that point, you'll, you'll take it knowing that you get the two chances, but no, I, I think they have to protect themselves with health and, and with rest to make sure they can, they can play their best game in, in what could very well be an elimination game on Tuesday night now. Yeah. The, the Tuesday layer adds even more reason to rest people, especially Steph who, you know, we could say whatever we want. Looks I think tired. That- Let's just say it. He looks tired. Yeah, he looks fatigued. Like, I know the seven turnovers weren't great. I know his shot hasn't been there. Except in the Lakers game, which was coming off the other time he got rest, right? Like, I think it does matter to just get him a little bit of rest. I do think this Warriors team is capable of beating other top 10 teams. I know it has been a rather disappointing season in that regard. I think they're capable of it, JD. But... As I said a couple of months ago, if you get A basketball from Clay Thompson, Andrew Wiggins, Draymond Green, Trace Jackson Davis, Jonathan Kaminga, and B to B minus basketball from Steph Curry, you're not winning. You're not getting out of the play in and you're not winning a playoff series. Like that's just the hard fact of this team. So you have to protect your 36 year old at all costs. Uh, I do think it's a good question from Alpha Nickelberry and. You know, I, I'm with you in that I was Mr. All-In, like they should go for it while they have the chance. Last night kind of sealed the deal. Speaking of Tim Kawakami, I know that in the middle of the Portland game, when it was looking a little iffy and could go either way, he was kind of out there thinking, do you rest Steph tomorrow either way, meaning the New Orleans game? And that take ended up kind of aging better than the initial reaction it got just because they were fatigued like – they could have benefit from it. I'm glad they went for it to try to get eight. And with what happened with the Kings, could you imagine had the Warriors rested Curry last night, 
they lose by 10 and then the Kings blow that game. Like that would have generated crazy reaction. Yeah. I, but, you got it. You had to play it out last night because it get, because you know that you have Sunday in your back pocket to be able to like, I, I, I have no issue with them playing nobody tomorrow if they choose to do it. Because at this point, again, the most likely outcome is, you know, I, I shouldn't be booking a Kings win at all. Uh, But as you look at it right now uh, and and Lakers Pelicans with the Pelicans going for it is, is no picnic, but you look at it right now and the Lakers are eight. So the Lakers, if they win, uh, they would be in a position where if they win, they're going to be eighth uh, at this point. If they win, uh, you know, and, they could win, which means the Pelicans could lose. And then the Suns potentially could, could also lose. They're playing Minnesota. We haven't even gotten to the, the top of the conference and, and everything that could happen there, which is wild off of the Denver loss last night where OKC now is in first and, and could wind up with the top spot. Very likely a, an OKC Minnesota Denver one, two, three uh, as it all shakes out. And so, you know, could you have a scenario where maybe the Pelicans and the Suns don't really want the six because the six means Denver, but that would also mean having to go through the playing tournament as opposed to, to getting the guaranteed spot. But all of that being said, when you look at the standings right now, if the Lakers win tomorrow against the Pelicans in New Orleans, then the Lakers will be eight uh, at that particular point in time. They'd finish a game ahead of Sacramento and the Warriors, regardless of what the Warriors do. How do the Warriors move up? Well, the more the Warriors could move up to eight themselves. They have to win tomorrow. And again, who knows who's going to be playing and they would need the Lakers to lose to the Pelicans and they would need Sacramento to lose at home to Portland. And uh, that's, you know, Portland's, we, we just saw Portland. I, I I'm not, I think the Kings are going to win that game tomorrow, but the Kings have had some real heartbreakers the last uh, week and a half to two weeks. And yeah, I, I, John T on there, Kings ain't losing to the Blazers, man. I, I don't think so either. Uh, but Rocker New Era says no guarantees in a Kings win versus any team. And the Kings did lose to Portland earlier in the year in Portland. The Kings did almost lose to Portland in Sacramento. They were actually down eight with about a minute and a half left and tied the game and it went to overtime and they ended up winning the game. That was back early in the season in November. Uh, but again, that was when Portland was playing all of their guys like Portland is not doing that now. So I, I think it's a different, a different situation and Sacramento still is playing for the fact, you know, they, they are the one team that is going to go all like, I think we know is going to go all out tomorrow of the three because they still want to at least get to nine uh, and, and host the, the nine, 10 game. And, and look, there's a realistic chance the Lakers lose to the Pelicans. So the Kings are going to go out hoping, forget about the Warriors. The Kings are going to go out hoping that they can get a win and the Lakers can take a loss. And that would at least, uh, you know, flip flop them in terms of, of positioning with, with the Lakers because they have the tiebreaker over the Lakers. So they, they could end up eight, uh, just based on forget about what the Warriors do. They can end up eight if they win and the Lakers lose. And so like that's, they're going to be going hard. Bottom line, Warriors need them both to lose and the Warriors need to win. That's the way the Warriors uh, move up to eight. The Warriors can move up to nine. Uh, obviously if they win uh, and the Warriors would then need the Lakers to lose uh, and it could be that scenario where it's either a three-way tie between the Lakers, Kings, and Warriors. In that scenario, the Kings would be eight, the Warriors would be nine, the Lakers would be 10. It could also be the two-way tie. It, the, the Kings could lose and the Warriors could win and the Lakers win. And then that would be uh, the Warriors nine and the Kings 10. That that still is a is a possibility. But again, that would be contingent on the Kings losing to Portland. So it, it's a, it's not confusing because it like it's, ba- it's, it's all basic. Now, uh, if, if one thing happens, it, it, it just stays the same uh, starting with the, with the Lakers. And we all know the tiebreakers uh, it's, you know, warriors over Lakers, two way tie 
Kings over Lakers, two-way tie. Kings, Warriors, Lakers, if it's a three-way tie uh, among among those teams. So that that's your easy way to, to keep score at home uh, as far as that goes. But yeah, I, I think the Warriors are more than comfortable going to Sacramento if that's what it needs to be. And, and here's the other part of it. And it comes back to, to what you know, Alpha Nickelberry had said as far as Phoenix and LA being a problem. Well, let's just say the Warriors do play Sacramento and they're happy about it. And it's, it's 10 at nine and it's Tuesday or Wednesday and the Warriors are comfortable. You're still at that point going to have to play the Lakers, Suns or Pelicans. Like one of those teams is going to be waiting for you in the second elimination game. If you do win in Sacramento on, on Tuesday or, or Wednesday. So um, at that point, I can understand the thinking of let's just make sure you're rested as possible because you're going to have to beat two of these teams no matter what. And they're all pretty good teams that that have proven that they can beat the Warriors this year. The Warriors have proven they can beat the Lakers. I think the Warriors have proven they can beat Sac. They beat Phoenix the most recent time that, that they played uh, the night before the Super Bowl. Pelicans, they haven't beaten in a while. Uh, and in fact, the, the you got to go all the way back to what game four uh, of the season. And I think we saw just what a difficult matchup the Pelicans are in terms of shooting length, size, like they, they kind of have it all. Your and, guy, Trey Murphy. Yeah, they, they kind of have it all. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's not a great matchup, but again, you're going to have to beat two of these other four teams. If you're going to be able to, it, whoever it is, you're going to have to beat some combination of of two of four between the Pelican Suns, Lakers, uh, and and the Sacramento Kings. So at, at this point, I think it does make a lot of sense, Greg, to just say, "All right, we'll take whatever we get. We're going to rest up tomorrow, and we'll take whatever we get. If it's Sac, great. If it's the Lakers, great." If it's home, great. If it's on the road, great. If it's Tuesday, great. If it's Wednesday, great. Like it's, I mean, there really is on an every level a, a, a take what you what you get. The the Warriors sitting at tenth right now control nothing. They control nothing tomorrow. They control yeah. nothing tomorrow. Everything is dictated by what do the Lakers do, what do the Kings do, and those two teams have much more to fight for in controlling or semi-controlling their own destinies. And also, you could say the Kings are a more favorable matchup for the Warriors than the Lakers in terms of not dealing with Anthony Davis, Malik Monk's injured, easier travel, yada, yada, yada. Kings are more involved than the Lakers are. All true. However, I think that you would rather take your chances with your rested stars against the Lakers rather than everybody be fatigued going to Sacramento and probably losing that game anyway. So I think it's important to get the rest. Uh, one thing I want to get to real quick, because we didn't have the chance to address this last night. It's sure. like a 10 second sound bite, but Curry in the fourth quarter kind of had that awkward little step where it looked like he rolled his ankle a little bit. Uh, they asked him about it in the press conference. He addressed it real quick. And I just wanted to uh, bring that to our Just Dub show and do our due diligence. Our defense feels real. I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. Come on. You might have tweaked your ankle a little bit in the fourth. Did, did something feel odd or no? I rolled it just slightly. But uh, on the scale of all the ankle injuries I've had, this is definitely on the moderate side, so I should be all right. So there you go. Yeah, should be all right. Uh, but again, if there was any question as to what do you do, I mean, you just don't want, you just can't, you can't have Steph rolling an ankle. You can't have Draymond, you know, getting hurt or something, tweaking something, the back issue pops up or, you know, something happens. Uh, and, and I think extra, a little bit extra rest for clay would, would work as well. I, I think everybody, I think everybody sits and I think Kaminga probably sits because it seems like this, this tailbone thing is it, it's a different injury. This is not the tendonitis. Uh, but I, I don't think like I think you want I think you want Kaminga to to be able to be you know fully healthy as much as I think you'd like to get Kaminga a little run I I think I think you got to make sure he's he's fully healthy as well. 
I would agree in the sense of look how many more games he missed than we expected. Like you pointed out, this was really interesting and a good call by you. When has Steve Kerr ever said in a pregame, no, he's not playing, but he will play the next game. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. really happen. And then, and then he missed two more after that. So I think when you take that into account, you probably do want to err on the side of just having Kaminga be as healthy as possible. Well, it sounds like Kaminga wants run. to make sure that he's healthy, health, as healthy as possible. It sounds like Kaminga, you know, in some ways kind of needs to clear himself or at least did on the knee thing uh, and, and did after a couple of games and, and, and that's fine. And, you know, he varying degrees of, of success in, in the games. Like he looked, he looked great against uh, Utah. Right. And then it, it ended up being, um, you know, he didn't look great in, in a couple of the other games, but so I, I trying to get adjusted to the new role uh, and all of that, as far as, you know, he's coming off the bench, he's not coming off the bench. I know he does. It's, it's not, does he care or not care? It's more to me, a rhythm thing and who you're playing with, uh, but again, you're not going to be playing with a normal rotation tomorrow anyway. So it, it, you know, at that point, I don't think getting him the run is, is even all that necessary. So I, I would think, I would think, uh, that, I mean, if I had, obviously you have to have enough players to, to, you know, have a game, right. You got to have eight or whatever. And the Warriors did sign Usman Garuba, uh, the, this morning to the, to they their, got a big, they got a big. <laughs> Usman Garuba, who's hardly played this year. He has been one of the Warriors two ways. They do sign him to uh, a contract to make him playoff eligible as the 15th spot. Uh, and, and you do it on the last day of the season. So basically you got to, I mean, you, you're paying him for, you're, you're, you're paying him whatever the NBA rate is for a couple of days. Um, He's the I, 2015 Onion Kuzmich. Yes. And, and so, you know, you, uh, yeah, that, that was done today, uh, earlier th- this morning. I don't think it's official yet, but it was reported, uh, within the last hour or so that, uh, yeah, Garuba will take the, the 15th roster spot. So yeah, I, I would imagine no Steph, no clay, no dream. Like if you're going to do it, you really do it. I would say no Steph, no clay, no Draymond. Uh, I would say no Chris Paul probably. Um, I mean, we've seen Chris Paul get, injured at the most inopportune times throughout the course of, of his career. So I, I don't think you want to have him, you know, risk something weird happening uh, tomorrow. So I think, I think those four for sure. Uh, I think Kaminga is in that boat for the reasons that, that we just talked about uh, as far as, as, as being a fifth. And then, you know, after that, I think I would probably play Wiggins uh, you know, I, I would probably just play Wiggins and just say, Hey, go get, you know, go get some run. I'd play tra- TJD. Uh, I'd, I'd play Pajemski. I guess Pajemski would start at the point. Uh, you know, Lester King Jonas is going to play Moody's going to, you know, Moody gets an opportunity to start um, potentially, you know, Sarich can play tomorrow. Looney's going to play tomorrow. Give me some gee. Guy Santos is going to play tomorrow. Like I, yeah, I, I would imagine that's, that's what tomorrow looks like. And uh, it should be a pretty even game considering who the Jets are playing right now. Yeah. I mean, one would think, right. And uh, I think the good news is you lose the game. Okay. Congrats. You're the 10 seed. Like it's kind of what we, expect yeah, and, you, and, and anyway. you, and you might be that anyway. In fact, you probably will be that right. anyway. Um, and again, you know, what, what happens with the Lakers? I think the Kings are winning tomorrow. And again, this is not the Kings playing OKC or Phoenix or the Pelicans or Boston or the Knicks. Like all th- those are the Kings last five losses are basically against all really good teams. They've kind of got caught in having a difficult part of their schedule coincide with losing Kevin Herter and, and Malik Monk. They've also lost some big leads. Uh, over the last couple, they were up 20 in New York. They were up 20 in Oklahoma city. They were up 16 last night at home. Uh, and they lost all three uh, of those games over the last week and a half to, to put themselves in the position that they're in. So no, I, I think the Kings win tomorrow. Uh, so I, I think the Kings win tomorrow and get to 46, which means the warriors wouldn't be able to pass them. Uh, regardless of of what happens, and then it and then it 
basically comes down to the to the Lakers and do the Lakers win or not to to stay at eight. And again, I think everybody wants seven or eight now because seven and eight in all likelihood, though, not 100 percent official are going to be Oklahoma City and Minnesota. It it really is most likely to be. OKC Minnesota or Minnesota OKC now when you when you look at the way uh, this thing shakes out and, and what's coming up tomorrow and OKC plays Dallas tomorrow and OKC playing Dallas tomorrow uh, and Kyrie and Luca are not playing the the Thunder of or the Mavs have already said that as far as that game goes so OKC is going to win tomorrow. So, you know, they're going to they're going to win tomorrow and then we wait and see what happens at the top with with Minnesota and Minnesota's playing Phoenix. So again, the the whole it's all interconnected kind of a thing. But yeah, I think the Kings win to get to 46 at that point. Uh if if the Lakers win, then the Lakers would stay at 8. If the Lakers lose at that point, uh then it would uh, obviously the the Kings would be able to to move up. Uh, with their 46th win and the and the tiebreaker over both the, the Lakers and, and the Warriors. So the, the Kings would move up if the Lakers lose and they win. And then it would just depend on what the mythical Warriors do uh, in that scenario uh, where the Lakers would drop down, but it would be a matter of do the Warriors who actually play tomorrow win? And if they did, then the Warriors would be nine. And if they don't, then the Warriors would be would be 10. The Joe but Lakeham special. The Joe Lakeham special where Joe's like, damn it, you were playing these guys on the off chance the Lakers lose because I want that home game. I want that home game. Um, so, yeah. So, we'll see. I mean, again, I, I would expect, and yes, Rock and New Era 84, wouldn't Lakeham want the play-in game at home so he can get the revenue from that game? Yeah. And and look, I would expect today that that's probably a conversation. Like, I, I not, and I'm not saying that there's going to be a, a final – like I, I would guess it gets it gets talked about or Joe at some point. I would almost a hundred percent guarantee. Like they may like there's a conversation had about it, and maybe Joe actually says, you know what, I don't care about that. Like I don't do do like, or maybe he does. But I, I would bet that there is a conversation about it either way today, uh, and then we'll find out when the injury report comes out around four thirty between 4.30 and 5.30, uh, I, w- I would estimate uh, as far as you know, who's actually going to be ruled out uh, ahead of time for the Warriors with the, the game at, at 12.30 tomorrow. Yeah, um, I, I don't think that – based on the oh, hell yeah answer to – Well, you know people, where Steve stands. We know yeah. where Steve stands. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure they do. Like, you can't look at the core right now. And be like, nah, they don't need rest. Like, it's fine. Like, oh, Steph doesn't need rest. It's like, he's resting. Clay probably resting. Draymond probably resting. I'm with you on Chris Paul. Why not rest him too? Like, the more Hall of Famers you can have available in big games, got to get every ounce of juice you can out of that one. Yeah, I, I, I think so. And look, I think it it puts you in a good – it puts you in a good position. Um you know, the best position that you could be in to go have, again, it's not win one. The goal is to win two. And, you know, as much as we talk about that first matchup, as we have a lot, uh, you know, having, having two chances, uh, you know, or needing to win both is, is the end game in this thing. So you have to be prepared for the grind. And we've seen the Warriors, I think pretty quickly, be a you know be ground down over a couple of games and and you know again especially with the prospect of potentially having to play Tuesday and and look here's the other thing they'll like they'll know because the the Philly scenarios all the East scenarios are going to play out in the 10 o'clock window tomorrow so the, the Eastern scenarios are going to be known by 12 12 30 tomorrow basically by 12 30 so if you really like you know, but you're going to be Tuesday or Wednesday. If it's Tuesday, I think you have to take the rest. But then the other part of it being Tuesday, I, I could see the Warriors that you, you like Tuesday in the sense, especially now that you know that you're only going to LA or Sacramento or you're playing at home. I, I think they like Tuesday because the second game is still Friday. So you would get two days in between that one. You basically would get 
three days between playing last night and Tuesday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So you, if, if the Warriors, like, I think it's just a no brainer. It, it, it's a no brainer tomorrow. You get the rest that you need leading up to let's say Tuesday. And then if you can win that game, you get multiple days. You'd get more than you would have otherwise. If you play Tuesday, uh, having the extra day before Friday. So I think it, that part would set the Warriors up, I think, pretty well uh, from a from a, a rested standpoint to be able to put their best effort effort forward in both games. Yeah, no, I agree with you in both cases. They've had so many, like, just one day in between games and a lot of travel going on in there. And we know this, J.D., because we do a show for every game. So I remember thinking – Man, when's the next time we get a like a two day gap between games? They've had a lot of three and fours. They've had a lot of five and seven or four and sevens, and and a uh, couple of back to backs thrown in there that have been brutal. So every day, or just the maximum spacing you can get, I think really does count at the season. And one day makes a big difference. So if you can rest everyone tomorrow, you play a day sooner, and you're able to win that nine ten game, and then you have an extra day in between a really tough challenge of possibly going to Phoenix or New Orleans or LA or wherever that may be, you take every day you can get. I I think they want the Tuesday scenario. Yeah, I I, I think they would. Yeah. Now that they know that it's not like going to New Orleans or or something like that. uh, I I think they probably do want the the Tuesday scenario because they, they get today. They, they can, they're going to take tomorrow you, you practice Monday and then you go play on, on Tuesday. Uh, and, you know, you fly wherever you bus, wherever, if it's SAC, you bus Monday. If it's, if it's LA, you fly Monday and, and you play Tuesday. And, 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 you know, if you have to go on the road and you play the game, you come back, you take, you know, hopefully you win. Obviously if you don't win, it's, it's over. We're, you know, it's a Mike Denley junior press conference on Thursday or Friday, uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, playing a, a second uh, elimination game. But but from a from a rest standpoint, I think the Warriors can come out of this thing relatively fresh for both games should they survive. And again, you never know who's going to get taken out in the first game. Like something could always happen in the first game that ends up impacting the second game, an injury or, or, or something along those lines. Just part of the deal when you put yourself in that position to to have to win the, the way that the Warriors now are likely uh, barring some kind of uh, oh, catastrophic collapse in, in Sacramento again, uh, you know, the, the Warriors are, are probably going to be the 10. Yeah, probably. I think last night was the difference between having a real shot at eight and probably being the 10. And yeah, they could be nine. Like we said, Pelicans got to try against the Lakers. So They win that game and the Kings beat Portland and the Warriors win without playing anybody, which I think you put in a very humorous way should be an even game because Utah isn't going to be playing anybody either. Yeah. Well, that's a path for them to get nine, but in all likelihood they're playing Tuesday or Wednesday, depending on this Philadelphia Flyers situation. Shout out to hockey here on just dubs on a Saturday morning impacting the NBA. It's a, it's, It's a big family gathering here. We love all the sports now. We are the sports leader. Am I right? We are. We are the sports leader here at at, at KMBR. Uh, Shen One chimed in early here as we got started uh, talking about last night's game because we were opened with some thoughts on the the Pelicans game. Think the second quarter meltdown happens on the road. It really, for the most part, hasn't happened on the road. Not nearly as much as it's happened at home. I, I can't really figure out why. Uh, I, I think there was a little bit of let up uh, when the Warriors got off to the the good start. I think they were up 21 to 10. Pelicans weren't hitting anything like the, the Warriors had a really, really, really good energy to them uh, at the beginning, as you pointed out. But the, that that energy, I think, led to some carelessness. And, you know, and, and and the Pelicans can ramp up their defense, I think, in ways that really makes the the Warriors uncomfortable offensively um, it, with the cuts and, you know, they, they play the passing lanes. Well, they kind of lay off in certain spots. Like they, they really try to take away a lot of what the warriors do uh, that, that makes the Warriors special in, in terms of the ball movement and, and the player movement. 
uh, aspect of it. And so they were, I think that was leading to some of the turnovers, but some of the turnovers are just, just careless, potentially fatigued Steph Curry madness, you know? And, and I mean, he was, he was the guy that, that really, you know, struggled the most last night and look, your best play. I mean, it's seven of the, of the 16 total turnovers. The Warriors had nine in the second quarter. And I think Curry had four of the nine in the second quarter. So um, yeah, I, I don't know whether it was getting ahead and the Warriors are up 26, 17 into the first quarter. They, they let up a little bit. I mean, shame on them if they did. Uh, I, I just think, you know, the turnovers and extra possessions and then the Pelicans were getting some open looks from three, the Warriors three point defense has just been brutal all year. I mean, they, they just, they oddly help off shooters in scenarios where they don't need to help. And it's just like a simple kick pass and it's a wide open, a lot of times corner threes wide open, just wing three. Like it's just, they, they, they give up the threes in the worst spots. Uh, and to, it just, it, I think it's part of why the great shooters have shot it well against them. But I think it's also why some random dudes have had some big games against them because the shots that, that they're getting, even though maybe they don't make them against other teams are still really good looks. I would actually disagree with your take on does this meltdown happen on the road a little bit because I want to, I'm more inclined to say yes. Like, I don't know if the careless turnovers and just handing teams possessions happens as frequently on the road this year for whatever reason, but because of the perimeter defense that you mentioned, I think that I could see the Pelicans getting just as hot. If that game's in new Orleans crowd momentum's into it. Uh, I mean, and look, like, against good teams, this has happened on the road, too. Like, you look at the Warriors, the other game they lost in the stretch, the Dallas game, they kind of lost that game in the first 12 minutes where Dallas just went on a rampage to start that game. Although, I guess it was really more like the first eight minutes, and they were down by 16 in a flash. And so, I think because of letting other teams get comfortable and get warm-up level shots – as Trace Jackson Davis kept saying, comfortable last night in the cut we played. I think for that reason, the second quarter meltdown could very well happen on the road. Uh, maybe not in the sense of the turnovers, but in the bad defense and letting another team get in their set. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and we've seen the Warriors lose some leads on the road, too, that have been bad stretch. I, I think that's kind of the, the difference is that that when it's happened at home, it's either been really bad, like like – 23 point swing bad in a quarter when it's happened at home. I, I think when it's happened on the road, the Warriors have been up 15 uh, uh, or, or, or 20. And, and so it's kind of made some of these games close games. And then the Warriors end up losing those games down the stretch. And you look back and it's like, Oh yeah, that, that run earlier in the game, you know, proved to prove to be the, the, the difference, but yeah, the, the turnover issues and the, cause I, I didn't think last night I saw a lot of this, like, Warriors were unserious last night. Like you can't have it both ways because I, I saw a lot on Thursday of, well, they weren't focused or they were looking ahead to the, the Pelicans game. And, you know, guys were out against Portland and, and Steph didn't look like he was really into it uh, against Portland and all that. Well, I, I think Steph was into it. I just think Steph was tired and pushing through it. And you might say, well, he just had a game off. Yeah. That's that's he just had a game off and then he had to play the Lakers. And then it just like, like, I think Steph's gassed. I think, you know, I do think the defensive rules have taken a toll. The emphasis they, they it's allowed teams to, to defend Steph, I think at a, at a higher level to where it, it doesn't change how great a player he is, but it makes him work harder to get what he gets, even if he ends up getting it. And so I think that has a, a cumulative toll. And again, I also think it goes back to a month ago and, and the every other day nature with back to backs mixed in of, of this schedule that to me takes a toll. And that's where the warriors were not going to be, you know, they, they were close to, but they were not going to, they were not going to go on the win every game kind of a run. Like there were going to be some games that they drop along the way, just based on the fact that, Fatigue wise, I didn't think they could make it through the grind. And I'll say this: I think they made it through better than I would have expected them to. You know, going back to March 16th when they started in LA, but like they were always going to have to. 
I think they were always going to look this week in particular and last week dog ass tired uh, at, at times to where you're like, you know, these guys need a break or these guys don't have enough to finish this off. And I, and I think it, you know, it ultimately, it ultimately, I think went a ways toward, toward solidifying their, their fate here, which is stuck in 10th with no true control over the ability to move up. So I remember around the all-star break, I was really fixated on the 22 and seven. That was kind of arbitrarily what I decided the record they needed if they wanted to maybe climb into top six at the time or or just have a real shot at getting into the playoffs and turning this thing around. I did the math on it uh, finally yesterday before the game. So last night was their 10th loss in that stretch. And not terrible all in all, but then you consider, so what would that be, 19 and 10 if they win tomorrow? But then you consider how much the other teams, like the Lakers and Suns, and uh, remember everyone was talking about how hard the Suns' schedule was down the stretch? Yeah. And then they're winning a bunch of games. Like, everybody except yeah. the Kings just keeps winning. So at, at the reality is, like, you're still stuck at 10 after all that. Yeah, and and the Kings were even doing it up until the last couple of weeks. Like the Kings were winning games in Minnesota, the Kings were winning games in in LA against the Clippers and the Lakers. Like they they won a, a lot of games uh, against, you know, some of these other teams. They just did it earlier in the year. Like that, now lately they have not been, right? They lost a couple of games to Dallas, they lost to OKC, they lost to Phoenix. They lost to the Pelicans. They lost to Boston. Like lately, they're losing to all of the teams that are, I mean, let's be honest, better than them, uh, I, I think, for the most part. But but yeah, it, it, I always I laughed and I, I think I mentioned it. I, I think I mentioned it at one point on the show. Um, but but I I a couple of different times had said to to people off air or off YouTube, I'd said, yeah, I don't buy the Phoenix thing. Like Phoenix is like Phoenix is, yeah, they're not going to win all of these, ga- all of these games, but they're also not going to lose all of them. Right. And so like, I, like when, when everybody was laying out the gauntlet to me, that meant, Oh, well, Phoenix will probably be 500 or, or Phoenix. Will, like that was, it was never like Phoenix was going to be seven and 20 or something like that. It was like, no, they might be 13 and 14. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or, or 14 and 13 over, over a stretch and and that's exactly you know that's exactly what they've done they've they won in denver a couple of times they won in sacramento they they beat the clippers barely when the clippers rested everybody but all of those wins count and all of those wins are the reason that that the suns right now are going to be six or seven as opposed to if the suns were fighting to be nine or ten which which would be the case if they had but they would have had to have lost a bunch of those games that, that they, that they didn't lose. Right. And I think that kind of comes back to good teams win enough games, regardless of who's on your schedule or what the circumstances are to be in a position to where you could be six or seven. Whereas teams like the Warriors or the Kings, and let's be honest, the Lakers for a really large chunk of this year do a lot of low level regular season S that puts you in this position. Like you don't take care of games that you should have, or in the words of Draymond Green, you don't steal games that you're not supposed to have. Like that's what gets you a level above. And I think with the Warriors in particular, why they have such a spotlight on them at all times, in addition to the four championships and everything that goes with that, is the Hall of Fame players know what it takes to win games. And as you've pointed out, very intelligently, JD. Hall of Fame players know when their team doesn't quite have it either. That's a great point. Yeah, no, they they do, and I I think you know at times I think this team, Greg, has I I think at times they've they've kind of wondered if they have it or not. I, I think the momentum of the last couple of weeks would lead them to think that that maybe they do have it in them uh, a little bit, but it it. You know, in the post mortem of this season, it took them too long to find it. It took them too long. Like that. That's that's my bigger picture takeaway. And I know we're going to talk a lot about this tomorrow because the game, in all likelihood, is not going to matter much. Again, we'll see. Uh, it's not official. If we do get some news on the on the lineups 
uh, and the injury report here before we get done at, at noon, we'll, we'll definitely pass it along to, to everybody with the early start tomorrow. But, you know, the, there are a bunch of big picture things with this team. And, you know, when you look at, okay, the Warriors end up 10th or they end up, end up 9th or, you know, whatever it is, probably 9 or 10, I, I think is the most likely outcome here. Um, I, but what we're going to look back on is, well, why did they end up 45 and 37? Or why did they end up 46 and 36? Because there's going to, yes, it's going to be a couple of games or at least a game better than it was last year. The momentum that they've had the last couple of months has been, I think, the best stretch of basketball that they've played at any point in the last two years. But the West is better, like top to bottom. Like every one of these teams, I think, in the West, except for Sacramento, is is like going to have a better record, and the Kings are pretty close. But um, so I, I think there, uh, when you when you look at it, it's it's going to come down to well, why did you end up where you were? And I think part of it's going to be the games that they kicked away. I think part of it, though, is going to be, and this is the part I wanted to touch on now, and we'll get into more tomorrow. Part of it is it took them too long to find themselves. And, and, they're, and you know, Draymond is a huge part of that with the suspension. Um, you know, the, the Kaminga stuff where, you know, he got off to a bad start. Like, I put some of that on him. Like, he got off to a bad start this year, which – kind of put him in the doghouse at times. And, you know, we can argue about whether he should have been or shouldn't have been. And there were times Steve Kerr screwed that up. And there were other times he did. But the reality is Kaminga didn't start playing well to like January, like like really middle December and then had a downturn. And then basically he's been pretty good the last three months, like full stop. So it, uh, but, but he did not play well the first six to eight weeks of, of the season for the most part. And, you know, that, created problems and so it really wasn't until the end of january that the warriors figured out okay clay needs to go clay needs to go to the bench and now he's back in the starting lineup but but clay was bad at the beginning wiggins was awful at the beginning he's been a lot better of late like there are so many different things that led to why they couldn't find themselves until the middle of the season, but their inability to, to find themselves before the, the end of January and February, that to me is when you look at next year, you, you got to account for that. Like, and there's going to be change, but you, like, you can't, you cannot take half the year to figure it out. Like you can't. And they did that this year. And I think they did it last year. And, the punch. And I, I know there are all kinds of reasons why, and I don't think the team last year was as talented or as complete as the team this year, but like we can't be doing November, December, ah, the rotation and nobody knows. And it takes 20 games and this guy's in and that guy's out and brought this guy over and he's disappointing. And Oh, Clay's back, but he stinks at the beginning of the year. Is he going to go to the bit? Like you can't wait. Like if you wait till January to figure it out, they're going to be in the exact same position next year. No, I think that was incredibly well said. Uh, and I think that's probably a good note to take a little intermission on too. And when we come back for part two of Just Dubs here on a Saturday, we're going to hear from Steve Kerr on Tolbert and Copes earlier in the week. We are going to get to some of the YouTube comments. We're going to continue this big picture discussion that JD just laid out for us and why it took so long for the Warriors to find themselves. And we're going to even push that to... Well, what have they found that's worth keeping next year? And if their season ends within the next week, what's the conversation we're having there? So uh, it is just dubs. And JD, you got anything to add before we take a little break? No, I I, I think it, it is a good place to 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 take a break and and you know kind of reconvene here in a, in a couple of minutes. I I need a glass of water or or a coffee. Uh, I don't think there's much doubt uh, about that at this point. But yeah, why did it take so long? And and it, it also ties into how real the finish is. And, and because it has, you know, the the record is the record, the, the 19 and 10 or, or whatever it is. I think we could even go maybe a little bit farther uh, back and, and the record is is even a little bit better than that. 
but I, I think it, how much of that is sustainable for next year? Because I think you could make the case you bring the same group back and you're just going to have a bunch of different problems at the beginning. And it won't be like, like you can't say, Hey, we went 29 and 12. And then that means you're going to be 29 and 12 in the first 41 games next year. Like, like you can't do that. And, and I know from a financial standpoint, they've got some decisions they want to make, which also factors into that. But, but those are the key questions I think is how, how do you, because you know go back two years ago go back two years ago they were you know 41 and 13 like the championship like the championship team was dominating on uh, the first three months of the season dominating like not oh we're figuring it out we're gonna make a run like no the like teams that go on a run like that figure it out a lot quicker it's the old what 40 before 20 thing Right, and it's, then and then Steph got hurt late in that year, JD, to the point where he actually came off the bench in the playoffs. But at that point, it was like, okay, we're not going to get the number one seed. We're going to be the number three seed, and it's going to be fine. And that's the other part of it too, which I've said a lot. You have to account for the fact that Curry's going to miss more than eight games or whatever, like because that, like the Warriors got incredibly injury lucky with Steph and Curry this year. They had good injury luck on Steph Curry. If he misses 12 more games, whew, this would be our last show for the year if he had missed 12 more games. And I think and you have to plan for that next year. So uh it, it's a it's a difficult puzzle to fit together. Uh yeah, we'll pause here, we'll come back. It's just dubs, it's JD, it's Greg Silver. Coffee time for Greg and JD. Yes, Irwin. More in the YouTube chat as well. Uh, KMB are the sports leader.
Hey, we're back, everybody. Welcome. The host has unmuted my mic, which means I'm talking to Greg. It's just Dubs. Saturday morning, KMBR, the sports leader on YouTube, Twitch, and the Twitter stream this morning. Uh, appreciate everybody who's uh, chimed in all season long as uh, we've been doing this thing since November with the Dubs OT shows. And I uh, do want to let everybody know before we get back into the conversation we were having before we paused that uh, we are going to be out at Harmonic Brewing tomorrow. Could be, hopefully not, could be the final time uh, for the 2024 season that uh, we're at Harmonic, the 1230 tip tomorrow. So we are going to be live at three o'clock uh, tomorrow from Harmonic Brewing in Thrive City. So if you're coming to the game, stop by, say hi, have a brew. Uh, we are looking forward to, to seeing you. And Greg Silver is going to be out there on hand, on site with me, uh, joining me at my uh, corner table there at uh, Harmonic. And we're going to start on YouTube and Twitch tomorrow. And then we're going to join at some point, uh, probably around 4 o'clock, we're going to join on KNBR. And so it, it's going to be at least an hour on the radio, but it's going to be at least a two-hour show uh on on youtube twitch and the and the twitter stream uh as well as uh we kind of recap the entire season we will know where the warriors will be uh based on the outcomes not only at chase but really more importantly in new orleans tomorrow as the lakers play the pelicans and in sacramento where the kings take on the blazers uh, as things sit right now lakers are eight a game up on both Sacramento, who's nine, and the Warriors, who dipped to 10. Bottom line, Lakers control eight. If they win tomorrow at New Orleans, they are eight. And then it would come down to if Sacramento wins, they would remain nine, and the Warriors would be stuck at 10. Warriors can move up to nine a couple of ways. Uh, if the Lakers win and secure eight, the Warriors could be nine if they win and the Kings lose. They could flip-flop and would play the Kings at chase in the 9-10 game, which is a scenario that hasn't really been discussed at all. Uh, I would say the, also the least likely. Also the least likely. Uh, that The other way that the Warriors could move up is the, the three-way tie scenario uh, as well, where the Lakers lose and both the Warriors and the Kings win. In that scenario, the Kings would move up to eight. And the Warriors would be nine and the Lakers would be 10 and the Warriors would host the Lakers in the nine, 10 matchup, which could be Tuesday and it could be Wednesday. Uh, a, a little plot twist from the NBA uh, this morning. And I, I was wondering, Greg, why the league hadn't confirmed the days, everybody, even though everybody kind of knew what the plan was for the, the seven, eight games are Tuesday. The nine, 10 games are Wednesday. The final games are Friday. That's how they've done it these last couple of years. It was Phil. It was the Sixers. They were hoping the Sixers would not be in the seven, eight game. And the Sixers may wind up being in the seven, eight game. And there's a hockey game at, at Wells Fargo uh, center in Philadelphia. And so if the, Sixers have to be a part of that game. They have to play Wednesday because the arena is not available on Tuesday. And that means that the late Western conference game would move uh, the nine, 10 game to Tuesday. And then the second elimination game again, should the Warriors advance off of the first one would still be uh, on Friday. So uh, a lot to chew on there. Uh, but yeah, uh, it, it, it's all going to come down to to tomorrow at twelve thirty. Uh, join us at at Harmonic Brewing and uh, say happy birthday to Greg. And happy oh, yeah. birthday to Claudine Dickinson. Yes, yes, as well. Hi, mom. Uh, if if you're watching on on YouTube, uh, also uh, what's up to Judith joining in and and in true Judith fashion, smashing that like button. So hey, much appreciated to you and everybody in the chat. Uh, we just shouted out all of our regulars throughout the season. And if you're one of the newer viewers, also appreciate the support. It's been great. We're, we're going to run this back next year, uh, you know, assuming that we don't get too sick of each other, like a marriage that sees each other every day. Um, well, that's the thing. We don't see each other every day. Like we do a right. lot of virtual, so we don't actually see each other every day. Like you were definitely going to be sick of me if I had to keep coming into the studio after every show. Because I, I, yeah, that, that was definitely not going to end well. No, assuming they can give Greg the bag to keep him around. Adam Copeland, 
then uh, then then we're going to run this back uh, for for 2024-25. So yeah, g- pay my guy the bag. Make sure it's worth his while to be uh, doing this show next year. I'm I'm just throwing that out there right now. Does Greg Silver or Clay Thompson deserve a better contract? And that's a good segue into a comment from FL Dubs fan from right before the break. If the Golden State Warriors re-sign Clay and have the big three core together next season, is that not just running it back? It doesn't have to be. That you could bring them back and not have it be running it back. You could bring them back and change course. No, what what running it back would be you bring Clay back and you bring Kaminga back and you bring Wiggins back and you you know Pajemski's back and tra- like running it back is basically this team. I I think the the only player that wouldn't among players who regularly play that doesn't come back in that scenario would be Chris Paul. Like I think Chris Paul is the one, but yeah, and you know John T uh, can't come back with the same team next year. I don't know who stays or goes, but can't do it. Yeah, and look, I don't think you. Ha- I've been reluctant. To me, it's not a core issue. Like to me, it's not a Steph Clay Dre issue. Like I would still want Steph Clay and Dre on the team in a perfect world. Like all three of them. I mean, look, Draymond and Steph are gonna be here. The only question mark is Clay with the, with the contract and, and and all of that uh but I, I, to me i it, the issue is can you be good enough around them to be a contender because you're not trading or letting any of that like if you're letting one or two of them go you're done anyway like you're not like clay thompson's not netting you anything he's either he's going to leave in free agency or he's going to come back you know, you're not trading Draymond Green for a superstar. So, like, it just and and I think you still want Draymond Green around because he's proven to be valuable when available. Now, has the trust been broken to a point where it can't continue? We'll see. I mean, that's an off-season conversation. I think Draymond's done as well as he possibly could since the the suspension in December to, to be able to get himself back in the good graces. But the one thing, you know, is he's always, I mean, it, 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 it's the 98% rule, right? You can be a great guy 98% of the time, but the 2% you're not, if it's bad enough, it doesn't matter. It wipes the 98% away. And, and like, you're, you're just, you're in big trouble. Uh, And I think, you know, Draymond, the good is always outweighed the bad. I think the good still outweighs the bad uh, as far as, but at some point, at some point there is actually going to be a last straw. I think we're all going to know it when it happens. Um, I don't know about you. You may have thought we were there at different points and maybe even in December we were there, Greg, but I, I I think it's going to be, I haven't reached that point where it's like, Oh yeah, he's done. Like he's done here or he's done in the league. Like, like it's come close, but I've never actually reached that point. Um, So I'll kind of kick it back to you in this sense and and answering the question. Like you want Steph Clay and Draymond back. At least I do, but it's the rest of it that has to be good enough or great enough. And it's, it's what do you do with Chris Paul? What do you do with Wiggins? What do you do with Kaminga? How do you get better along those lines uh, to, to make this team? It, It comes back to, they need a second star because Clay is not that anymore. Draymond is still fine as the glue guy. They found something with this TJD Draymond lineup. I don't know that it's a, a playoff starting lineup every game, but they found something with it. I know we've got a, a, a Kerr cut from earlier in the week. We're going to play at some point here between now and noon on that. Uh, I'm, I'm getting off on a million tangents here as I often do. But to me, the issue is not taking away from the big three to add because taking away from the big three isn't going to get you that second star anyway. It's how can you try to use the other pieces to add a second star around the big three that accounts for the big threes decline. And that that's just what it is. I know we hate saying that, but that's what it is. The big three is declined. The big three can't carry this team, but, but moving off of them for similar players or lesser players doesn't help you get better either. I think the tricky thing, too, is 
I don't know what trade assets the Warriors have. Let's say they do bring Clay back. Let's say they work out a contract with Clay Thompson. Two years, it aligns with Steve Kerr and Steph Curry, and I guess Draymond has one beyond that. But by and large, they're all aligned in this kind of like last dance of two years or whatever we want to call it. You could trade Kaminga. I would say maybe Moses Moody is an asset, though in a package and not on his own. And then the tricky thing is, I would think you'd like to keep Pajemski and Trace Jackson Davis around because of how good they've been as rookies. And it's rare that rookies in a Steve Kerr system get this level of trust and playing time. But then again, you kind of got to pick your fork in the road at some point too. And do you have to throw one of those in a trade package if you want a true second star? Like the, the thing that was pointed out to us in the chat a few months ago that I thought was great insight. And I always kind of go back to is in any kind of trade scenario, the Warriors will have the lower hand because of their circumstances of aging superstars and trying to hold on to something and keep this thing going. They will have the lower hand in trade negotiations because they will be more desperate than any team they negotiate with. And the only other team you can put in that boat is the Lakers, which have something in common with the aging Hall of Fame superstar. Yeah, but at least the Lakers have a, they have a second star. The Lakers, and I, they're both aging, and especially LeBron, obviously, who's going to be 40 at the end of the year. Uh, or wait, did he just turn 40? No, the 40 at the end of this year. I, LeBron always screws me up because his birthday's in literally the second to last day of the year. So it always kind of, I'm like, oh, wait, yeah, he's 40, but this year, but it's like, basically two days away from next year when it's so uh, anyway, the, uh, it, but uh, shout out LeBron Capricorn, fellow Capricorn. Appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, at least they have the second star. Like that's the, that's the, th- like the warriors don't have the second star. Like I, I, I think the warriors, everything they're trying to do, whether it's the decline of, of clay who can still be productive or where Draymond's at now, or even Steph who, can't quite carry this team as consistently as he has in the past. Uh, it, it's subtle, but I think it's, it's noticeable. Like, let's just be real about it. Uh, part of that is the, the pieces around him. Part of it is just, he's getting a little bit older. He's still great, but it isn't quite what it has been. Uh, so it, the issue to me is things would make a lot more sense if the Warriors had the second star. And, and it was Steph and it was player X and then you've got Draymond and clay. And then you figure out, you know, which young players are still around at that point. I think you, you definitely want TJD around. I think you would, I think Steve Kerr wants Pajemski around. Uh, I mean, he's got a, a stor- historically great plus minus for a rookie guard. I know you had that that note the other night on uh, fun with numbers on, on yeah, but last night, put a dent in it. It's all over. Minus he was ugly last night. Like it was ugly. Minus 25 last night. I think it was what plus 277 or something like that for the season before last night. Uh so yeah, it did it did take a, a chunk out of that. But like everything makes more sense if you have the second star, which kind of comes back to you know the conversation that we'd had about you know my Kaminga take, which is and you know with some of the injury stuff, I think the momentum is quelled a little bit on Kaminga and their ability to win even against some lesser opponents without him, I think, you know, showed something. I don't know what totally. Uh, I I know Steve made, has made the point that he really likes the TJD Draymond combo and the ability to not have to play Draymond at the five all the time. Again, if Kaminga is going to be a starter though, he's got to be at the four so that means Draymond, if he's going to be a starter, has to be at the five, which means TJD has got to come off the bench. All of those things uh, are, are factors in this thing, but it comes down to like clay ain't going to be a number two star anymore. Draymond isn't going to be, and never has been a number two star. So is Kuminga next year, the number two star. And I think the answer is probably no. Like, I mean, maybe by the end of the year, he could be if he you know ascends and 
continues to develop. Maybe a, a year from now we're having that. Oh, it's Steph. And, but, but are we, is it really going to be, and I'm not saying it's not, I'm just asking the question skeptically. Is it really going to be this time next year? Oh yeah. Steph and Kaminga one, two, like can, can win a title the following year off of, off of that. Like, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I would lean probably not. Well, if that's not the case, then how do you get the star? And the only way you get the star is looking to move Kaminga. Like that's just like, he's the only young player that has enough value to where you could net that player. So I think that's again, not to be redundant because we've talked about that a lot. And I do want to get back into, you know, some of the other stuff we were talking about as far as, uh, you know, just, you know, why did it take this team so long to get together this year and get on the run that they did this year? And, and how does that all factor into the off season? The reality though, is it can't stay the same, but the Warriors also want to kind of keep it the same. So that, that there's your tell. Like, I think, I, I think when you read between the lines here, the, the Warriors are telling you the ways that they have to potentially get better. If you're, if you're listening to them and and accepting them whether you agree with them or not accepting them as present i think that's a good way of putting it uh you know and then the other piece that is a bit of a question mark at times is wiggins but unlike kuminga wiggins has a fat contract he's a little older and he hasn't been quite as present and so i think that you know the warriors like we've said on the show before they could trade wiggins and be worse off for it but the overarching point with Wiggins is if you trade him, you're essentially getting rid of your problem and p- taking on somebody else's problem. Like it's got to be a one-to-one kind of transaction in that regard. Whereas with Kaminga, it's like you could get someone that could help you win now, but the sacrifice is he's 21 years old and has massive potential and has taken a big leap this year. So that's why when it comes to, do you want to contend that's the piece that is most likely to be moved and really the only one that can kind of get you to that path. Yeah. I, I, I think it's, it's pretty simple when you look at it, that, that he is the only one. And again, I uh, look, the warriors love them. There are some in the organization that really love them uh, and don't want to give up what he could be even in the post Steph era. But the, the, thing that the Warriors are going to have to determine is, you know, is he going to be a, like, it's not even necessarily, can he be a two with Steph next year? It's also, can he be a one beyond Steph? Like, is he a one? Like, is, is he a franchise player in three years? Like you have to like that. You can be a 50 win team. If he's your best player, like do you have to make that projection? And, 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 you know, the other part is they're going to have to pay him uh, or, or, I mean, they don't have to pay him, but he is extension eligible. Uh, but the Warriors could, you know, they could play it out with him, make him do it again, basically not extend him. But if, if they look to extend him, I mean, he's going to be 120 to $130 million player in all likelihood yeah. now, based on the way that he's played the last three months, three months ago, I wouldn't have said that, but uh, you know, even that component of it is important and it could lead to a little bit of a tricky dynamic where it's already been a little tricky between his camp and the organization, right? Like, and, and I think they've both tried to mend that and I don't, you know, I don't think it's at the forefront right now, but it has been a little dicey and, and who's to say it doesn't get more dicey if, the Warriors are like, yeah, uh, we'll pay you next year, but we're not going to, we're not going to, we're not going to give you the bag this year because you're under contract next year and you're a restricted free agent. So we could match any offer like you're ours, dude, for the next five years, if we want you. So, and we don't have to give you $130 million right now. So yeah. like, again, they also could do what they did with Jordan Poole, which is give them the bag play out next year and then his salary alone might allow for you to trade for somebody, but that's also a dangerous game because 
his value, you know, you don't want a guy's value to plummet once he becomes a 30 plus million dollar a year player. Uh, then, then it becomes very difficult to trade that player, even if he's only what 23 at that point. Yeah. I mean, I'm to be honest, I'm surprised that they were able to offload Jordan Poole's contract. I think the Washington wizards have been a rather dysfunctional organization for quite some time now in the post John wall era. And then eventually getting rid of Bradley Beal this summer too. So I don't know how many teams would have taken that load off. Uh, I think the Warriors kind of got away with one when you consider the contract they offered pool. And it's not like pools necessarily lighting up the league right now either. Like I am not anti Jordan pool. I'm rooting for him to still have a solid NBA career, but it, that trade isn't like you look at it and it was a James Harden Rockets situation where it's like, Oh yeah, we let somebody go uh, just because of a punch. It's a different story. Like it is. I, I think that all fits into the equation too of the Draymond Green situation where he seems to always play his way out of bad behavior by doing things that only he can bring to the table. Um, and that's why he's still under contract. Like he's older and it is the 98% rule JD that when he's been out on the floor, it's great to have, and it's won the Warriors some big games, but when he's not on the floor, we've seen what kind of team this is. And if we're going to tie this back into Kaminga, I think right like this year with Kaminga, and I don't think this is a very hot take to say he's a number three on a really good team. He's a number two on a 10 seed. And he's a number one on the Portland Trailblazers. And I don't know what he will be a year from now, but that's kind of what you have to think of him as in 2024 in the spring. Well, and and then the, and then the, that becomes: Do you can you afford to wait around for him to get to the point? You know what I mean? Can you can you afford to wait around for him to to continue to you know potentially ascend? And I think the answer is yes. If you think in a couple of years he can be a one on a really good team. And so that like, that's, that's the, the part of the equation that, that the Warriors are going to, and look, you got to figure it out ahead of time. You got to figure that stuff out ahead of time. Uh, and it, it's not easy. It, it really isn't because, you know, Kaminga has come on and he's been impactful and yet he still, and they're going to have to pay him. And, you know, they, they kind of need him. I think, you know, regular season wise, they need him. Um, and, you know, we'll see Judah Pierre after JP. I think the Warriors need to, ha to have a wait and see attitude. Um, uh, and yeah, I mean, I could see them doing that. But I mean, that that's where I think it would get ugly again, because, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I, as I always am, but I, I'm going to, I would bet right now and we don't have to like, we, we can, we can, you know, mark the tape. Like, I, I'm just going to say one thing about Kaminga. I would bet that Kaminga, it gets reported in the, in the off season or, or as the extension gets closer, the, the, the extension deadline, October, I would bet that Kaminga and his camp want a max deal. I, I will I will bet that Kaminga wants his full max, which I don't know what I, I don't offhand know exactly what it is. Like I, I bet he wants like if it's like 150, I'll bet he wants like because it, it the Jaden McDaniels comp is kind of the one. Didn't Jaden McDaniels get yeah, he got 136, yeah. I think. Um, and so I kind of feel like Kaminga's like, well, I'm better than that, dude, even though I don't think he necessarily is, but uh, but he projects to be, I don't know that he is now as a two way player, you know, again, that's the other part of it. Kaminga's got to get better defensively, but I, I would bet. And, and I wonder how that, I wonder how that changes things. Cause I, I, again, and I, I'll fully come on and I'll admit I, if that, if that doesn't happen, I'll be like, Hey, I thought it was gonna happen. I was wrong, but I would, I would be willing to bet that Kaminga's going to want his max like right now, based on what he's done to this point, uh, you know, and okay, we'll see. Like, do you think that, and I don't want to do the whole extrapolation game, but because a lot of our discussions are going to be about this next week, do you think if he stinks it up 
in elimination games or if the Warriors get into a playoff series and he stinks it up, do you still hold that take? Or do you think it's dependent on if he plays well in elimination games in a playoffs? Wait, say that again. Say that so I'm saying, do you, do you still agree with that take of his camp saying he wants a max deal if this season ends really poorly for him, like if he stinks it up in elimination games, I, I don't think he's going to play badly enough to wear. And, and I think the injury there, the, some of the injury concerns may mitigate some of that. Like, like he may not play as big a role because of some of the injury concerns. Like that's just reality. Um, but, and, but no, I, I, I don't think he's going to play badly enough to where it would hurt where it would hurt that like, cause he could easily make the case. Hey, it's my first time. Really. It's the first time you guys have really let me play in any of these situations. So, you know, it learning experience or whatever. So no, I, I actually don't think it, I don't think how he plays in a couple of elimination games, assuming he plays, uh, which hopefully he is able to play. Cause uh, you know, again, he was missed last night. Like that's, you know, he just the rim pressure, the easy buckets, like he had the ability to just kind of go at, the Pelicans in, in ways that the Warriors really didn't have in their bag last night and, and, and kind of needed. So uh, I, I do think his, his game was, was missed. Uh, but yeah, I, I again, it, it really does. I do think Kaminga is the the pivot point for the whole off season. I, I, I as we start to get into it, the, the other question I have for you, and we can ask the chat this because this, this also relates to, you know, this team was 19 and 24 on January 27th after they lost to the Lakers and and the Kings, the, the double overtime, the back-to-back one point losses to the Lakers and double OT and to the Kings on January 25th. And what I wanted to ask was they were 19 and 24. Since then, they're 26 and 12. And so that's the that's the number that I, I, I wanted to come come back with, uh, because I think that's the number that the Warriors could sell. Uh, you know, let's say they win. Let's just say they win tomorrow. Um, even if they don't win tomorrow, let, you know, let, let's say they don't win tomorrow. Let's say it's just 26 and 13 over the final 39 games. That's basically half a season. They would be 26 and, and 13. And, you know, that like, I could see the Warriors trying to sell kind of running it back again, because running it back is different this year than last year, because the young players are more involved and, and saying to everybody, this is the, this is the team. This is our team now. The team that we have now, yes, we were bad enough in the first half to where we were still 10th, but we were good enough in the second half to where we were winning. I mean, what is like two thirds of our games? Like literally. So that that's like, and again, I don't think it's reality, but they could, they could say, hey, well, that's 54, 55 win pace. Like that, that's a, you know, 54. I'm just saying, I'm just throwing it out at you. Like, cause, cause again, as we start to look at next year, like these are all the, these are all the options. Like they're going to have to pick one of these options. And so like, are they going to choose to believe they are the, the 26 and 13 team because that, or are they going to choose to believe that they're the 45 and 37 team? Like that's, that to me is, and I think it's a different question than last year because last year they didn't play nearly this well for as long a stretch. Last year they just cobbled yeah, it together. True. Last year they just cobbled it together for five games at the end and got a lucky matchup and the West stunk. So they're, I mean, they should have been 10 11 last year and they ended up six. The Kings should have been seven, six, seven last year. They ended up third. They it had just, one of the greatest players of all time go berserk in a game seven. Exactly. And yes. And they were, and they five different times could have lost that series on like one play. So it just, and didn't. And that's fine. And they, like the championship experience, I think, and the Kings being newbies, all that I think played, played a role. Uh, and, and, and then they didn't have anything left in the tank against the Lakers and they got beat. And, you know, that that led them to say the big three specifically has more in the tank. This year, it's different. Like this year, it's we this year, the 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 stance is more. We know the big three 
isn't as good, but we have these young players and it all fits together now. And we figured it out. And, 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 you know, it, so I'm just saying if they wanted to make the claim, they could make the claim. Would you buy it? Would the people buy it? No. I think there's two things why I say that. One is, like you said, they got very good injury luck with Stephen Curry this year. Is he going to miss eight games next year? You cannot count on that for a 36, 37-year-old. Two, Chris Paul's probably not going to be on the team. I think Chris Paul was much more of a positive than a negative. And if you want to play the game of, I hate Chris Paul, but the young players were great and contributed to this team, that's a double standard. Like, I don't buy that whatsoever. And I'm not saying that Trace Jackson Davis and Brandon Pajemski don't have bright futures with the team. But if you don't have a steady second unit guy, and especially if Steph's got a missed time, what are you going to do? Run a lineup with Pajemski as your starting point guard and have Clay and maybe Moody and Kaminga and Draymond slash TJD? Is Looney still going to be around? Like, I don't know. I think you got to do... I honestly think this, JD, I think if you sell it like that, you're going to spend the first part of the season, maybe not the first half of the season, but you're going to spend the first chunk figuring out the right combinations again. Yeah. And the West is going to be better. Yeah. No. Cause as we've talked about a lot, I mean, the Rockets project to be better. We'll see on them. Like I, I, you know, I could see them kind of being the same or stepping back a little bit. Memphis uh, will be better. Memphis is going to be better and the Spurs. I, I think definitely project to be better. And they have some, some means, via picks, via trade options, via free agency. Like they, they could sign uh, a couple of players uh, in, in the off season as well and, and make some moves around Wimbenyama, who's ascending toward, you know, he, he, Wimbenyama is very close to being in that position where him alone is going to be like, Oh, you're going to win 40 games or 41 games. Like they're there. I think they're maybe not next year, but I think by, in, you know, in two years, um, I, I think, there like he's already at that point where oh yeah you got him it's kind of like it's the um this was before your time but it was the the shack effect like the the magic won 20 games and got shack and then they won 41 games like like immediately <laughs> and so uh it it and then and then they got penny hardaway and it went to like 57 and then then the, the next year after that they were in the finals so it just like it, 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 so I think that I'm not saying that's where Sa- San Antonio doesn't have the second player uh, in that equation yet, but uh, they're very close to, yeah, women Yama's on the team. You're at least going to be a 500 team, which obviously would, would put you in the mix for, for the top 10. Most yeah. years, most and years. By the way, with Wemby, like considering that the rest of his team around him is not very good. And he didn't really know what he was doing for the first half of the year. It's kind of scary watching this guy. Like, I know Denver, you know, blew the 17-point lead to the Spurs and everything last night. I don't think that is as bad as it seems at face value when you consider the way that it's trending for San Antonio. Uh, Yeah. No, I, 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 I would agree with that. I, I would agree with that. I mean, it was, it was Wemby like kind of a coming out moment in a way for him, like against the defending champions in a, in a game that was in a, in a true spoiler game, right? There aren't a lot of spoiler games anymore because all these teams get to the end of the year and they quit like, like the blazers and the jazz and, you know, Memphis had 13 players out last night uh, against the Lakers. Now, a lot of that is, is legitimate injuries, but, but for the most part, teams that are out of it down the stretch quit. Uh, the Spurs haven't totally done that in part because of, of Wimby. Like they, they actually, they've actually been kind of a pain in the ass for everybody the last couple of months. Uh, they haven't won a lot, but they, they've been, they've been trouble. I mean, they're still 21 and 60. I mean, whatever, you know, they're still what fourth worst record in the league or fifth worst record in the league and all that. But, but they've had a lot of competitive losses 
against against some good teams here in the in the back half of of the season. So yeah, I, I'm kind of with you on that. As stunning as it was, and as much as it really, fl- I mean, it just flips everything on its ear. Like all of these teams that have the potential to be eight now are just, I think, thinking about it completely differently. And that's not to say OKC doesn't dispatch of Team X or Minnesota Team Y, but I, I mean, you look at the the play in tournament. Whether it winds up being Suns, Kings, Warriors, Lakers, or Pelicans, Kings, Warriors, Lakers, I, I mean, no matter how it ends up, I mean, those are, the, you know, two of those four teams are going home and two of them are going on. And like, like all of those teams, I think, maybe with the exception of SAC because they're injured and, and leaking oil, but I think all of the other teams, Warriors, Lakers, Suns, Pelicans, if they're playing Minnesota or OKC, like I almost feel like the underdog team would get picked in like like I feel like in I feel like Lakers, Warriors, Suns, Pelicans are like the favorite in a lot of people's eyes against OKC or Minnesota in a 7-2 or an 8-1. Yeah, I can tell you where the betting money's going. Yeah. Totally. So I, I mean that that that's going to make for for compelling uh, playoffs. I, I think in a perfect world, I think the the NBA would love the Warriors. You know, they would love the Warriors and the Lakers, but that that isn't necessarily going to be able. To, I mean, it can if the Lakers get eight and they move up to seven. Uh, but some combination of Warriors, Suns, Lakers. Really, Warriors, Lakers, Suns. I think the Suns would be the third option, uh, obviously in in that scenario. But, uh, but yeah, they're gonna. I mean, there's a there's a decent chance, and and I guess the the Suns could end up six. So the Suns could end up six, maybe the Lakers seven, and the Warriors eight. Like that's kind of the, the you know the scenario where you get all the 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 big market kind of teams in there. Or as my Um, friend put it so kindly to me, a good Kings fan, dedicated Kings fan. I know the hall of fame, old heads and the Kings. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. The hall of fame, old heads and the Kings. I, I didn't, um, I didn't catch this till very late last night. Um, I, I don't know that I, I, it was disappointing to see Mike Brown go in on the officials. Like I, I, I didn't, I didn't really. So I only was made aware of that when the chat was talking about it. I haven't seen a lot of that yet. That was disappointing. And it wasn't crazy. Like he, he, you know, he wasn't like, it wasn't a rant. I mean, it was a very, like he didn't, it wasn't like he was screaming and hollering or anything. He just was kind of in the very Mike Brown, uh, matter of fact, just kind of, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, it's, you know, can't get a guy gets hit in the face in Boston and, uh, you know, like he, it was very, it was very conversational. It wasn't like, you know, screaming and hollering and losing his mind. But, uh, yeah, I, I thought it was interesting that he, he chose to go to the victim card in the, in, in that moment. And w- and like that we'll see, like it could still work out. Okay. For the Kings, if they end up eight, uh, but yeah, I, I thought it was interesting that he it was just it was kind of a bummer that he went to that card. And, you know, it looked like De'Aaron Fox might have got fouled. I didn't think he got fouled in real time. If he did, it, he got bumped. It wasn't on the I mean, he lost the ball. Um, But I, I don't know. I I, I don't know. I, I don't want to necessarily relitigate the call, Um, but it I just I, I think I think it was unfortunate that that was the night like basically they're coming apart at the seams. And rather than just kind of accept it and own it, it was like, oh, we've actually been screwed three times in the last four games. Like, I, 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 that's not, that's not good. Uh, was it just as, Andis, was it just as good as, no, the, no, the laptop press conference was, was actually really funny. That was and incredible. It was really, that was really good. Um, but no, it was, <laughs> that was really good. No, it was not like that. It was just, it was very matter of fact. Um, but yeah, I, I, again, I just, they're in a weird place. I don't, I, again, why don't need, this is just dubs. So we don't need to spend a lot of time, but obviously I watched the Kings a lot. I went up to, and saw the game when they played the Pelicans. They, they are seemingly always tied to the Warriors. 
uh, and and could be again here in a, in a couple of days uh, in in an elimination game. But I, I thought it was disappointing that that he chose to kind of make them the victims and and have that be the rallying cry as opposed to just accepting the fact that, you know, they haven't played well enough down the stretch in some games and they do have some injuries, which I think is, you know, legitimate and they've played really good teams. Like, you know, I, it sucks if you're a Kings fan right now that they've, they're kind of falling apart and it really sucks. I think for, and I know a lot of Kings fans, just like you do, it really sucks that uh, this season is trending toward like legitimately being, worse than last year. Like they, like they're probably going to be trending, even if they make the playoffs, they're going to be trending in the wrong direction. Um, you know, unless they can pull off an upset somehow. Uh, but it, it, to me that like going to that, it's not our fault or we're not culpable card for a team that's in their position. If they wind up not doing something special, which they probably won't. I think that sets a very weird tone toward next year for them. Uh, and, yeah. and, and toward his uh, ability to be accountable as somebody who's been one of the best head coaches in the league the last couple of years and a big part of their success. Like I, I think that has the potential to get really weird if they like, if they can't get in and do something crazy. No, I mean, Next I, I got to look at the uh, press conference. I got some free time later with some giants post game and everything. Actually, speaking of the Giants, I do want to make sure that we are on the clock for the last 14 minutes here okay. so we can get our guy, Walter Rico okay, yeah. ready for the Giants warm-up on YouTube. Uh, it's actually going on on KMBR right now, but we'll get him on YouTube at 12. And boy, do the Giants need an extra long warm-up today. Woo! Um, but back to the Warriors. Yeah. Something we brought up on last week's Just Dubs and kind of ties into the conversation of this week of Trace Jackson Davis and looking long term, Trace Jackson Davis got a pretty clear cosign from Steve Kerr and Steph Curry. And then I wanted to play this cut from Steve Kerr on with Tolbert and Copes earlier this week. If you haven't checked out that interview, I thought it was pretty good. If you need 20 minutes to fold laundry, do some dishes, whatever it is, pretty solid use of time there. Uh, and in addition to random talk about OJ Simpson's death and Tom Tolbert being a goofball. Uh, they all, they did talk about Trace Jackson Davis. And I thought this cut was a really interesting one because of it's quite the contrast from being very adamant about playing Draymond at the five and then Kaminga and Wiggins sharing the front court. And then this is what Steve Kerr had to say when it came to Trace Jackson Davis and playing him at the five a little bit more. I mean, we've had yeah. stretches where, you know, when we were playing Draymond at the five, JK and Wiggs at the three and the four, you know, switching everything where we've had really good defensive stretches, but it always felt vulnerable, you know, just based on size and, and um, you know, Draymond having to, to handle such a, a responsibility protecting the rim and trying to, you know, maneuver things the way he does when he's at the four. But with Trace at the five and Draymond at the four, that the defense feels real. And I, the other guy who I really want to point out is Wiggs. Wiggs has been fantastic. Yeah. You know, yeah. he um, he was so good against the Lakers early on, setting a tone against D'Angelo Russell, who's just been um, amazing this this season and and so explosive. And um, Wiggs just handled the, that assignment so well and set a tone early in the game. And and so Wiggs is in a great place too. And it feels like with the, the group we have now, uh, our defense is, is for real. And, and that generally yeah. translates. So, you know, hopefully that keeps going. Yeah. I mean, that, that tells me that he'd like to start the year next year with his, with Draymond and Trace Jackson Davis in the front court. That, that, that's sort of the big, like I, it, it can change in the playoffs or in a play and elimination game, things can change. They've dusted off Looney of late. I think they could dust off Looney in, in some of these play-in games for experience and size. Uh, maybe not as a starter, I, I, as a, as somebody that that kind of subs in here and there. But I don't know. My my big takeaway on that is that he kind of used TJD and Draymond as a a, a foundational 
you know, a couple of pieces of being a good defensive team in a, in a regular season scenario. Like, like I think that plays toward going into next year. It also says, well, then what does that mean for Kaminga? Like that's the other, because, you know, are they going to try to use Kaminga as a super sub? Uh, and again, he can are still they gonna try to make him a three or are they going to try to make him a three, which I don't think they're going to do. Um, but it, it's interesting because it, it's twofold, right? What does Kaminga need to be able to be a three? He needs a better handle and a more consistent three point shot. No, number one and, and more consistent, just decision-making, I think in terms of getting to his spots and, and, you know, taking the right shots, like shot selection. Uh, he also he also needs to become a much better defender because the, the difference between him and Wiggins is as a de, as defenders is like it's not even it's just not even in they're not even in the same stratosphere. Um, and so, you know, Wiggins uh, Wiggins is that primary. You're going to be on the, you know, main guy for the other team like he can guard the the point guard or he can guard the the guard that's got the ball in his hand like Kaminga he can hold Luca to a 30 point triple double which I'm not even saying sarcastically like that was that was a good game against Luca and he still had 30 yeah no exactly he's so it's like that's the thing like I don't that is a fair question do they try to make Kaminga a three and I, I think I think we know the answer to that I think the answer to that's no um, but then it's also like, okay, well, is again, I think he's, he's cool being a sub now because the team won every game that he didn't play except for one. And he's a little banged up and Steve's assured him that he's going to play a lot if he's healthy. And again, they're winning, which I think a lot of Kaminga's frustrations were coming from the team losing and him not being a part of it. Like I, I do think a lot of Kaminga's frustrations came from a, from a, a, a good place and a better place than maybe I had originally stated it as coming from um, going back. But I, I, again, is he going to be cool that like, it's, it's one thing to be cool that in April when your team's winning every game and you're a little banged up, are you going to be cool with that in October when you're also trying to be maybe a max player? Uh, in terms of a contract extension. So I, I it's, it's fascinating. And also are the warriors willing to, Hey, we're going to develop you as the three and, and now you're going to be at the three and Wiggins is gone. And we're just going to live with the lot. Like that's asking to get off to a bad start next year as a team, like, or a clunky start trying to figure things out. Uh, so I, again, it's, it, it, it's all connected. It, it's all connected. Uh, to LM saying if Clay's gone, Wiggins at the two, JK at the three, would that work? No. Where's your shooting? You know, yeah, you no shooting. Yeah, I mean they don't have an, again. They don't have enough shooting with Clay and Steph. And with good Clay. Yeah, they they still don't have enough shooting in in my mind. So, uh, I, I again, it, it's going to be, you know, and Kaminga can play. And, and, you know, the other thing that was interesting about the, the Portland game, and we didn't talk about this after the Portland game, the, the TJD Kaminga thing, like, did it wasn't great. Like, that's still got to be part of this too, right? Because we know Draymond and Kaminga can play together, be effective. We know Draymond and TJD can play together, be effective. We don't totally know Kaminga and TJD together, like how effective that could be. Um, and it, you know, it wasn't great against Portland. It was kind of one game. Um, but you know, that combination has to be able to be solidified. And I, I think at times they get buckets in the same areas and it, it kind of, I, I think they might get in each other's way a little bit offensively. Uh, so, you know, again, we'll, we'll see. I, we're not going to have a, a firm determination on, on any of that uh, over, over the two to 10 games that are maybe remaining for the Warriors in a, in a play in and a, in a playoff, uh, just kind of wrapping things up here. Uh, just dubs with JD and, and Greg silver here on a, on a Saturday. Do you want to let everybody know again to join us tomorrow at harmonic brewing, uh, in thrive city, uh, as we'll be on right about three o'clock on YouTube, Twitch and the can be our Twitter stream. Uh, and then, 
We're going to be on the radio sometime between three and four, probably closer to four. Might just be a hard four at, at this point. I know the Rays are, are actually starting that game a little bit later than originally uh, scheduled. I guess they've got some kind of pregame ceremony thing. So the first pitch is going to be closer to 11, uh, which which probably puts us at, at – uh, being on around four o'clock. So stop by, say hi. We got a full season in review live show. We'll talk about the playoffs. We'll talk about the play in. We'll know the matchup. We'll know where the warrior we've got coverage plans for you uh, to, to get to as far as how we're going to be uh, going about things. We'll know if it's Tuesday or Wednesday uh, that the warriors are, are going to be playing both of those uh, options on the table. And yeah, as far as tomorrow goes and uh, FL dubs fan, uh, this was early on. Uh, so, J.D., you really think the Warriors are like, so be it. I thought all sp- uh, pro sports teams uh, take any advantage they can. Home court, injuries, bad matchups, whatever. I thought they exploit any advantage. I really do think they're – I do really think the Warriors are are just going to let the chips fall tomorrow because they don't control anything. Like, they could, they could go all out tomorrow, win, and still be 10th. And I think that's the – or they could do nothing tomorrow and still be 10th. Or they could do nothing tomorrow and be eighth. <laughs> like, I, I mean, d- depending upon it, just to kind of lay out the scenarios one more time. Uh, so everybody has them uh, as well here before we we call it uh, a morning uh, and, and reconvene tomorrow from, from Harmonic. Uh, right now, the Lakers are eight and the Kings are nine and the Warriors are 10. The Lakers control eight. The Lakers are playing at the Pelicans. All these games tomorrow are 1230. If the Lakers beat the Pelicans tomorrow, the Lakers are eight. Uh, if, if it, regardless of what happens uh, with the Kings or the Warriors, who are a game now behind the Lakers, so the Lakers control eight uh, if they can win at New Orleans. No picnic. New Orleans needs that win to be six, which obviously would avoid the play-in tournament. Sounds like Ingram's coming back. Uh, and then beyond that, if if the Lakers lose, uh, it does open the door. Uh, for the Warriors who would also need the Kings to lose for the Warriors to move up to eight. So that's how the Warriors could move up from 10 to eight. A win. Don't know who's playing for the Warriors plus Lakers and Kings losses. Warriors could move up to nine a couple of ways. Uh, It it could be uh, they win and the Kings lose. That would get them to nine if the Lakers win uh, in that scenario. Uh, The other scenario could be uh, the Kings win, the Lakers lose. Kings move up to eight, and then that would drop, that would flip where the Warriors would have the tiebreaker if they uh, were to win over the Lakers. Uh, and that would mean they would be nine and the Lakers would be 10. So it could be could be Warriors and Kings in either venue, could be Lakers and Warriors in either venue, depending upon all of the scenarios. Greg, great stuff. Uh, yeah. Fozzie says he's coming out tomorrow. Can't wait. Uh, rock new era 84 and Judith and everybody in the chat. Erwin Kwong. Uh, thanks to everybody. Greg, final thoughts to you. And then, uh, we'll hand this thing off to Walter. Every game, every possible elimination game is going to have a lot of storylines. So I'm looking forward to it. Uh, one that I kind of hope to see just selfishly because I was at this one in person a rematch of the Draymond slash Nurkic revenge game. <laughs> yeah. That'd be, that'd be an entertaining one. Although the Warriors struggle in Phoenix, but still, you know, got to win two elimination games. That's where they are. We'll do a full great show tomorrow season in review. And, uh, and that's that for me. Yeah. Looking forward to it for Greg. I'm JD. This, uh, this show will be available in, in podcast form. We'll make sure we get the links tweeted out. Uh, everybody. Yeah. As Joe H says, have a great Saturday. Thanks, Greg and JD, all those comments, uh, as well. We'll talk to you tomorrow from harmonic, uh, for Greg, I'm JD can be the sports leader.